Hey everyone, it's Tim from Lanessa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining us again today. So what makes up over 50% of the genetics of your flock and is often ignored or neglected? Stay tuned to find out. When it comes to the males that you have in your flock, and this can be sheep, this can be goats, this can be cattle, this can be almost anything, there's a lot of confusion about this, and it, I wouldn't even necessarily say it's confusion as much as it just is overlooking what I think is intuitive and obvious. And once we talk about this today, I think you're gonna have a new way of looking at the males in your flock and why they are so important and why it's so important to take care of them in a very specific manner. There's things about these males that you need to consider. And the very first thing that you need to consider is that these males, any male that you get, any breeding male that you bring into your flock or your herd, this is very, very important. And the reason this is so important is because you're gonna bring in one single animal that is gonna make up over 50% of the genetics of your babies that you're going to have. So when you're spending time, when you're spending money, and when you're looking at adding to your flock or your herd, it is imperative that you really put that time and that money into getting a very, very nice ram or buck. Because again, you know, you can take, think of it this way, you can have a bad you, you can have a bad doe. You know, you can make a purchase, kind of roll the dice and see what happens. And you know, if you breed them and things don't necessarily work out, you have a couple bad babies, you can ultimately cull that animal and send them on down the road, call it a wash and go from there. But what happens if you invest time and money into a breeding male that completely messes up your flock? So what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about sickly or unthrifty males that are just going to add those bad genetics to your flock. Maybe this animal just doesn't put on weight well, he doesn't have good feed conversion ratio, or maybe this uh, fella is just kind of lazy. He's not really necessarily interested in the ladies. He's kind of a, a lazy breeder. That's not good either. Maybe it's all in the mouth. Maybe there's something wrong. Maybe it's got an overbite. Maybe it's off side to side. Maybe it's got something wrong with its pasterns. Maybe its feet uh, tend to sag a little bit too much. Or maybe there's something wrong with its gait. Maybe its toes are pitched in too much or out too much. All of these things are going to be bad traits that you're going to breed into your flock or your herd. So it's really, really imperative that you really, really look into these things before you bring this male in. And I'm telling you, you know, it, when it comes to being picky, I am never ever as picky as I am when I'm picking a new male to come in. And if I'm going to pick a replacement male to come in, they almost have to be perfect for me to do so because it just causes such havoc and, and so much trouble that it is not worth messing with. So there's a few things that I want you to consider and a few things that are often overlooked besides that point. And the very first thing that comes to mind and the basis of this video that we're going to talk about today is keeping your male separated from the rest of the flock or herd for a majority of the year. And I want you to understand why this is beneficial to you, why this is beneficial to your flock or your herd, and, and how it's going to make things better for you overall. So I've got three main points that I want you to consider, and I want to get started talking about those right now. The first point that I want to talk about is overall general diet and nutrition when it comes to your males. Now, if you've been watching any of our videos, you already know what I'm going to talk about. And what I'm going to tell you is, is that all of your animals need to be fed differently. If I could break down feeding your livestock into three separate categories, I would say the way that we feed our adult females, the way we feed our lambs and our goat kids, and then the way we feed our adult males. Now, we've gone over this over and over and over about urinary calculi, and I still get messages about this. If you haven't read up on urinary calculi, or you don't know what I'm talking about, I want you to check that out right here. A majority of the year, your males need to have a very specific diet that consists of 
lots of calcium and very little phosphorus. This phosphorus calcium ratio is very important when it comes to the overall health of your males and preventing urinary calculi. Now this goes into play too with your juvenile males, um, but today we're just talking specifically about our adult males. So the problem comes in and when you're running your males all together with your lambs and with your uh, ewes or your kids and your does is that you have this problem when it comes to making ends meet with feed because you've got your rams which or your bucks that have a very specific dietary need. You have your ewes or your does that have a very specific dietary need. And then you have your kids that have, or your lambs that have a very specific dietary need. And it's very hard to get all of those to mesh correctly together. The benefit is, is having them all separated out, having them all in their own area and being able to individually control the feed that they are getting. The other thing that you're going to want to consider is how do rams and bucks work? Now, uh, really the thing that you need to think about is what are they thinking mentally? And what they're thinking mentally, at least if you have a good ram or a good buck, is they're focused on breeding all of the time. Now, those of you that have raised sheep or goats before know that the user does will actually only stand for a male for a certain period of time, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to try. And so the issue that we run into a lot of times and what we see a lot of other farms that make this mistake of running their males with, with their females all the time is they get this chronic wasting effect with their males. And they say, man, our males just look really, really bad. They're in really poor health. They seem to be wasting away and what's going on? Well, what's going on is in the hierarchy of the way males think, uh, at least the males that we want for good breed breeding purposes is they think about breeding first and foremost and everything else comes next. So they focus on breeding and then they think about eating and they think about sleeping and they think about drinking but their main focus is, is they're going to be chasing the girls around all day long and if they can get a girl to stand still long enough for them they're going to try to breed them and over time this just wears them down you know when we put males in with females for breeding uh, even in the fall what we do is we will put a, a, a buck or a ram in there that isn't even going to impregnate them just to get him to run himself ragged. Uh, and then once they start to go into estrus and he starts to land them, then we'll put our breeder in there. And you might think, why in the world would you do this? Well, the reality is, is when those uh, ewes and does are in, in heat, you know, that male isn't going to eat, he isn't going to sleep, he isn't going to drink. All he's going to do is try to breed those, those females. And so we put our teaser in there or we put our waster uh, ram or buck in there and he's going to look like death warmed over after a couple weeks of doing that. And then we're going to put our healthy male in there and we're going to try to help with that overall uh, better breeding. And that brings me to the second point. The second point is you get better breeding and you get more control over your breeding. So the reality of, learn, of running a ram or a buck with your females all year round is you're completely giving up control. You're giving up all that control about the timing of your babies. You're giving up all of that control about the overall health and welfare of your babies. And the reason for that is, is instead of having all of those ewes or all of those does getting time together and having their babies all at one time, now they're gonna be spread out all over the place. And once they get spread out all over the place, it's very, very difficult to get them back in sync with each other again. And so the issue that you run into is it's gonna hurt you. You know, it's gonna hurt everything that's going on. It, you will find on your farm, and for those of you that raise sheep and goats already, you know this, is that the more animals you can bundle together, the more things you can bundle together, the better off you are and the better care you're providing to those animals. So that means, you know, if you're able to wean everyone at the same time, man, that is really helpful. If you're able to give vaccinations all at the same time, that's great and helpful. You know, all of these things come into play when you're timing that breeding with your males by keeping them separated. So now, you know, if you need to take a week off of work for lambing or kidding, just so that you can be there when they're all born. If you need to set a weekend aside for weaning or set a weekend aside for vaccinations, you have the ability to do that. And so timing, keeping those males separated out from those females, introducing them and knowing when they're gonna have their babies really, really pays dividends. And I want you to think about that. I want you to think about how many sleepless nights have you had where you're up worrying about, are there gonna be babies born? You know, how many times have you thought, oh, I really need a wean this weekend, but I can't because I've got a family function or I wanna plan a vacation, but I can't go out of town. Think about that and then correlate the two and say, man, you know what? I really would be better off syncing my males up with my females, 
it's as simple as putting a marking harness on them and putting them in there and you know when they're bred and when they're going to have their babies. The other thing, the science tells us over and over and over that if you have your males away from your females, you give your females the right diet and nutrition, you give your males the right diet and nutrition, and you then put them together after they've been apart for a while, you're going to have more babies, those ewes and does are going to ovulate harder, you're gonna have more twins, you're gonna have more triplets, and you're gonna have overall healthier, genetically speaking, babies. Um, and that is just a fact based off the science that we get over and over and over from universities all across the world. If you have questions or concerns, you can let us know. The best way to get in touch with us and the best way to get your questions answered is on our community forum, which can be found on Facebook. We are at Lanessa Farms Tack Box. Just search Lanessa Farms Tack Box on Facebook. If you'd like to give us a call or shoot us an email, feel free to do that as well. I can't always answer all of your questions, but I will do my best to make sure that I get you the help that you need. Um, if you need any information as far as forms are concerned or downloads, anything like that, make sure you check out Lanessa Farms farms.com go to the upper right hand corner to the download section and we have all kinds of free stuff there for you including medication lists um, breeding schedules and everything and anything you can think of and of course we only feed foundation feed we think that's the best feed in the united states we always offer free shipping for orders over 100 dollars. and if you don't order 100 dollars worth of stuff that's fine too you can get it sent to you for only a buck the last thing that I wanna talk about, and I don't know how to rank this one. You know, I thought about putting this one first and I thought about putting this one last. And really, boy, when this goes bad, it really goes bad and that is aggression. And we talked about aggression in the past. We talked about it right here. If you haven't seen the video, Overhandling your males, this is a huge, huge problem. And nine times out of 10, if you have an aggressive male, it is your fault. Um, I hear a lot of people say, oh, my male just got really, really mean. And the reason that your male got really, really mean is a lot of times because you handled them incorrectly. Either you loved on them too much, they might've been a bottle baby, um, they just got too used to you. Now they look at you as a member of the flock and they've decided that they wanna challenge you. When it comes to aggression, the best advice I can give you is the advice that I gave you in the video, but I want you to understand it a little bit more. And I just wanted to briefly touch on it here. And this is the thing about breeding and good breeding males. A good breeding male will actually be a little bit on the aggressive side. We want them to be aggressive breeders. We don't want them to be lazy like a house dog uh, to where they're like, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Maybe I'll breed, maybe I won't. You know, these guys have a window of time that they need to fit into. They need to be able to land as many user does as possible. And we want to have a little bit of an aggressive breeder. We want to have a good amount of testosterone going through this animal. And we want him to have the desire to get out there and get the job done. You can't have it both ways. You cannot have an aggressive breeding animal that's going to really go out there and get the job done and get it done well. And you know, super cuddly and cute and all of those things that you may want in a pet. If you want a pet, I suggest you get a weather. Um, consider getting a weather and keeping a weather with your ram um, and then you can love on that one all that you want. But be aware of the fact that you're probably going to become aggressive as well. So the best way to handle this is to keep them confined. And I'm not talking about a six by six pen. You know, a lot of times when I say confinement, people kind of balk at that and say, oh, you know, I can't keep them in this little pen. I'm not asking you to keep them in a little pen. I'm asking you to keep them in a pen, maybe 20 by 20 or 40 by 40, depending on how many you have and keep a buddy in there with them. Keep a couple of males together. We have a couple of males that we keep together. We have four that we keep together um, and keep them in there and keep them occupied and just stay the heck away from them. You know, go pet a you, go pet a doe, go pick up a baby and cuddle with them and just leave your boys the heck alone because every single time you go in there and you try to handle them and talk to them and do things like that, uh, it is just causing more heartache for you and for your farm. So when you think of those males, I want you to think of them as just like, you know, an ex-boyfriend or an ex-girlfriend, like, eh, you try to be on the mature side so you'll tolerate them, but the reality is, is you don't really like them and they don't really like you. Maybe you can wave from a distance, uh, but other than that, that's about as far as the relationship needs to go, unless you've got some mental problems. And in that case, you may need to go see someone that you can talk to about that, but I'm not the guy. So. With that being said, I'm Tim from Lenessa Farm Specialty and Heirloom Livestock. Thanks for joining me again today. I look forward to seeing you again next time.